but she would not yield a day before the date set. The weeks dragged on, the time narrowed. Orders were given to deck the ship for the wedding, a wedding at sea among icebergs and walruses. Five days more, and all would be over. So the blonde reflected with a sigh and a tear. Oh, where was her true love, and why, and why did he not come and save her? At that moment he was lifting his harpoon to strike a whale in Bering Strait, five thousand miles away by way of the Arctic Ocean, and twenty thousand by the way of the Horn. That was the reason. He struck, but not with perfect aim. His foot slipped, and he fell into the whale's mouth and went down his throat. He was insensible five days. Then he came to himself and heard voices. Daylight was streaming through a hole cut in the whale's roof. He climbed out and astonished the sailors who were hoisting blubber up a ship's side. He recognized the vessel, flew aboard, surprised the wedding party at the altar, and exclaimed, Stop the proceedings, I'm here. Come to my arms, my own. There were footnotes to this extravagant piece of literature wherein the author endeavored to show that the whole thing was within the possibilities. He said he got the incident of the whale traveling from Bering Strait to the coast of Greenland, 5,000 miles in five days, through the Arctic Ocean, from Charles Reed's Love Me Little, Love Me Long, and considered that that established the fact that the thing could be done. Any instance to Jonah's adventure is proof that a man could live in a whale's belly and added if a preacher could stand it three days, a lawyer certainly could stand it five. There was a fiercer storm than ever in the editorial sanctum now, and the stranger was peremptorily discharged and his manuscript flung at his head. But he had already delayed things so much that there was not time for someone else to rewrite the chapter, and so the paper came out without any novel in it. It was but a feeble, struggling, stupid journal, and the absence of the novel probably shook public confidence. At any rate, before the first sight of the next issue went to press, the weekly Occidental died as peacefully as an infant. An effort was made to resurrect it with the proposed advantage of a telling new title, and Mr. F. said that the Phoenix would be just the name for it, because it would give the idea of a resurrection from its dead ashes and a new and undreamed-of condition of splendor. But some low-priced smarty on one of the dailies suggested that we call it the Lazarus. And inasmuch as the people who were profound in scriptural matters but thought the resurrected Lazarus and the dilapidated mendicant that begged in the rich man's gateway were one and the same person, the name became the laughing stock of the town and killed the paper for good and all. I was sorry enough, for I was very proud of being connected with a literary paper, prouder than I've been of anything since, perhaps. I had written some rhymes for it, poetry I considered it, and it was a great grief to me that the production was on the first side of the issue that was not completed, and hence did not see the light. But time brings its revenges, and I can put it in here. It will answer in place of a tear dropped into the memory of the lost Occidental. The idea, not the chief idea, but the vehicle that bears it, was probably suggested by the old song called The Raging Canal, but I cannot remember now. I do remember, though, that at the time I thought my doggerel was one of the ablest poems of the age. The Aged Pilot Man on the Erie Canal it was, all on a summer's day, I sailed forth with my parents far away to Albany. From out the clouds at noon that day there came a dreadful storm that piled the billows high about and filled us with alarm. A man came rushing from a house, saying, Snub up your boat, I pray. Snub up your boat, snub up, alas, snub up while yet you may. Our captain cast one glance astern, and forward glanced he, and said, My wife and little ones I never more shall see. Said Dollinger, the pilot man, in noble words but few, Fear not, but lean on Dollinger, and he will fetch you through. The boat drove on, the frightened mules tore through the rain and wind, and 
Bravely still in dangerous posts, the whip boy strode behind. Come board, come board, the captain cried, nor tempt so wild a storm. But still the raging mules advanced, and still the boy strode on. And then the captain to us all, alas, tis plain to me, the greater danger is not there, but here upon the sea. So let us strive while life remains to save all souls on board, and then if die at last we must let I cannot speak the word. Said Dollinger, the pilot man, towering above the crew, Fear not, but trust in Dollinger, and he will fetch you through. Low bridge, low bridge, all heads went down, the laboring bark sped on. A mill we passed, we passed a church, hamlets and fields of corn, and all the world came out to see, and chased along the shore, crying, Alas, alas, the sheeted rain, the wind, the tempest roar, Alas, the gallant ship and crew, can nothing help them more? And from our deck sad eyes looked out across the stormy scene. The tossing wake of billows aft, the bending forest screen, the chickens sheltered under carts and lee of barn, the cows, the scurrying swine with straw in mouth, the wild spray from our bows. She balances, she wavers, now let her go about. If she misses, stays, and broaches too, we're all, then with a shout, hurrah, hurrah, a vast belay, take in more sail, Lord, what a gale. Oh boy, haul taut that high mule's tail. Ho, lighten ship, ho, man the pump, ho, hostler, heave the lead. O oh, quarter three, to shoaling fast, three feet large, three feet, three feet scant, I cried in fright, oh, there is no retreat. Said Dollinger, the pilot man, as the vessel flew, Fear not, but trust in Dollinger, and he will fetch you through. A panic struck the bravest hearts, The boldest cheek turned pale, For plain to all the shoaling said, A leak had burst the ditch's bed, And straight as bolt from crossbow sped, Our ship swept on with shoaling lead, And before the fearful gale, Sever the tow-line, cripple the mules, too late, here comes a shock. Another length and the fated craft would have swum in the saving lock. Then gathered together the shipwrecked crew and took one last embrace, while sorrowful tears from despairing eyes ran down each hopeless face. And some did think of their little ones whom they never more might see, and others of waiting wives at home and mothers that grieved would be. But of all the children of misery, there on that poor sinking frame, but one spake words of hope and faith, and I worshipped as they came. Said Dollinger, the pilot man, fear not, but trust in Dollinger, for he will fetch you through. Lo, scarce the words have passed his lips, the dauntless prophet saith, when every soul about him seeth a wonder crown his faith. And count ye all, both great and small, as numbered with the dead. For mariner, for forty year, on eerie boy and man, I never saw such a storm, or one with it began. So overboard a keg of nails, and anvils three we threw, likewise four bales of gunny sacks, two hundred pounds of glue, two sacks of corn, four ditto wheat, a box of books, a cow, a violin, Lord Byron's works, a ripsaw and a sow. A curve, a curve, the dangers grow, labboard, starboard, steady so. Hard a port, dole, heel him a lee, haw the head mule, and aft one gee. Luff, bring her to the wind. For straight a farmer brought a plank, mysteriously inspired, and lay it upon the ship, and silent awe retired. Then every sufferer stood amazed, that pilot man before, a moment stood, then wondering turned, and speechless walked ashore.